January the 22nd at 6 p.m. We will have a potluck dinner January the 29th to honor our college graduates, Gracie Fuller and Nathan Turner. <coughs> Please let Jean and Mickey Davidson know if you can help with the dinner. We did not take our Christmas offering for the Methodist Family Health. If you would like to make a donation, please make your donations to the church marked for Methodist Family Health or make it directly to the Methodist Family Health. Your gift will be used to support children and families. Are there any other announcements? Thank you, Father. Now I have a question. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Okay. Thank you, Bobby. There's also yeah. going to be a meeting of the youth today at 2 o'clock for you folks who were painting crosses. Miss Emily's gathering folks again to paint crosses. The youth are doing or putting together some very nicely painted crosses to offer you to support our trip to Veritas this year. Any others?
Goodness, are we still asleep? <laughs> that should be Miss Penny. She should still be asleep. So today we're going to talk about what happens at your house when all the lights go out. The electricity goes off. What happens? It's dark. Will somebody go get a flashlight? Light the candles? Why do we do that? So we can see. That's right. God sent some people to bring the light of God into the world. And in the Old Testament, the last one he sent, I think, was Isaiah. And nobody really wanted to listen to what he said. So God decided it was time to send the true light. Who would that be? Jesus. That's right. Jesus was the true light of the world. He's the one that we're supposed to be trying to be like. So we're supposed to let our light of God shine so that the dark world can see. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say the dark world? Not really? Well, when we talk about the dark world, we're talking about the world of sin. Where everybody's doing what they want to do and they're not really paying attention to the right way to do things. Hmm? Do you guys do that? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Well, God has called each and every one of us to be the light of the world. To help people who are living in the dark world to find the light of Jesus. You guys think you do that? You think you could be a light? You guys are being too quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants to say our prayer this morning? I don't want to talk this morning. All right, let's bow our heads and say a prayer. Loving God, thank you for sending Jesus to be the light to teach us how to be the light. Lord, we ask that you would walk with us each day and let your light shine through us. Amen. All right, what time is it? Candy time. For our joys and concerns this morning, what are you happy about this morning? Yes, ma'am. The church. <laughs> the improvements of my great grandchild. Amen. Amen. Child of Amen. Amen. What was that, Miss Barry? That we can come to church. Can come to church. Thank God. Really? Help us get a new healthy baby. Healthy son. Some on the back. That's the way I always do things backwards. <laughs> Stephanie Powell and the mission team had a good trip. I understand they had a lot of trouble traveling, but uh, the playground equipment is up. 
Thanks to Vic Richmond and his crew. Thank you, Vic. Okay. Miss Clara. Miss Clara was in town with until, until Friday. Friday. She would love to see everyone. Um, but not between two and five. Not between two and five p.m. So go early or go late. <laughs> but not too early. Not right? too early. Not too late. <laughs> This list of uh, prayer requests is huge. Barksdale Collins, is that correct? And Michael Freeman? Furman. Furman from Fort Smith. It's Mickey's son and he's in the hospital in Fort Smith. Ah, Mickey's son in the hospital in Fort Smith. Ukraine and Russia. Everyone with cold and flu and those exposed. Dylan Trot, Prudence Hefner, Taylor Rowland, Miranda Rocca, Cohen Gregory, Kaylin Rivera, Reed Williams, Ian Miller, Chance Adams, Theta Coleman, Marlena Keyes, Sue Leifer, Billy and Nikki Terrell, Becky Hall, Jody Lambert, David Whisperer, Stephanie Powell, Stephen Jones, Linda K. Arnold, Lauren Jackson Garner, Annie Head, Zach Miller, Mary K. Bird, Johnny Turner, Johnny and Shirley Schwinn, Bill Brown, Lee Scarborough, Lee Catherine Anderson, Becky Mott, Robert Dennis, Jay Hall, Amanda Strickland, Shelton Guest, Joyce Summerhill, Judy Bellamy and Debbie Gordon, Gil Pillow, Drew Perkins, Helen Harper, Wanda Brock, Sheila Brock Smith, Janelle Prime, Bert Hankins, Lindsey Hudson, Kenneth Guest, Tammy Duggar, Michael Furman, Dorothy King, uh, Jerry Thompson uh, Rabin, Otto Latham, Hayden Johnson, Carol Martin, Dennis Nelson, David Treadway, Courtney Turner, Francis Shell, Joseph Cumberland, Mike and Charlotte Bain, Nita Corbin, <coughs> Dale Tyner, Melba Robinson, Albert and Pam Godfrey, Jean Richmond, Terry R. Sullivan, Kara Abel, <coughs> Archie Archer Shirley. Doing better, that's, that's a good, good thing. Wayne Johnson Brown, Dale Webster, Winston Turner, Lewis Acock, Debbie Hayes, Brenda Woodyard, Russell Lee, Shirley Young, Wanda Snyder, Robbie Lasseter, Carolyn Sue Hill Campbell, Glenn Hosey, Mackie Fur, Jimmy Oliver, Carolyn and Mary Wilkerson, uh, Mary Hendricks McDowell, Alan and Pam Wildshoots, Fern King Williams, Bonnie and Curtis Petty, Pam Catlin, Garrett Howard, Agnes and Earl Whitson, Magnolia Dotty, Berkeley Leonard, Laurel Coker. Catlett and Sherry Lynn Cameron, Linda Moten, uh, Katie Jacks, Charles and Barbara Robinson, Rebecca Ferguson, Hewitt Perkins, Mary Blush, Karen Reed, Jim Gateway, Bubba and Jamie Morris, Linda McDade and Alex Lee, Jared Fan. 
Janine Sane and family, the death of her father, and the family of Wesley Griffith. And who was that, Bobby, that you wanted to mention? Well, Freddie Paul Schneider, but you know, I guess I don't know if he's my own. Freddie Paul? Okay. Any others? God, we are grateful people as we bow our hearts and heads before you, entering into your presence, Lord, knowing of your deep love for us and knowing of the ways, Lord, that we often fall short. God, for those things in us that are broken, for those words that we have spoken, for the deeds that we've done and left undone, Lord, for the ways that we've rebelled against your love and failed to hear the cry of the needy around us, forgive us, we pray. Free us for, through your Son, Jesus Christ, in order that we might be the church of Jesus Christ for the world. God, thank you for this opportunity to read what is a substantial list of names, knowing that you are a part of every one of those people's lives. Lord, what a joy it is to lift them up in prayer, to see them improve, to know that they believe in the power of prayer, that, that there is a positive energy that we share when we pray. God, we know that prayer doesn't change things. We change things, but prayer changes us. And then we, in turn, change the world. Lord, it's only through the power of your Holy Spirit that we can stand here and offer ourselves to you. It's only through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that has washed us clean of our sins that we can come before you in robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, for those who are sick, we pray that you would pour your Spirit out on them, that their bodies would begin to improve, and that speedily, Lord. We know that you are a God of healing and that it is by your stripes that we are healed. Lord, for those who have lost loved ones during this time, we pray for their comfort, for their peace. Lord, for their recovery as they walk through this season of mourning, as they experience for themselves the valley of the shadow. Lord God, we thank you because you have chosen every person in the sound of my voice. You have chosen us and called us your own. You have given us the authority, the power to be sons and daughters of the living God. And it is with the confidence of your children we offer the prayer that Jesus teaches us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time I'm asking the ushers to come forward. have just alerted me to the fact that my batteries are dead, which is odd because I changed them out last week. Let me invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you for the many ways that you bless us individually and collectively. We thank you for the resources that we share with this church. God, we ask that you take these gifts, that you would bless them, that you would multiply them, and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
please stand as we sing the doxology. Praise God for Before I read this morning's text, I, I want to um, share something I just find the oddest thing. So last week we preached the prologue to John's Gospel, where John introduces us to this um, theme that runs throughout his Gospel, that theme of light and life. And so last week, as I was standing in the sanctuary at Lexi United Methodist Church, with the heaters running and the lights on, preparing for worship, the lights went off. And so earlier this week, I had a call from David um, Treadway telling me that APNL had sent out a message and they were going to be turning off the power between 8 and 5 p.m. today. And so he was concerned that we were going to be there in the dark again. And so I made sure that the back room was warm and we worshiped back there again because there's light coming in the windows and we could see and the power did not go off. <laughs> I want to share with you today a passage of scripture from the prophecies of Isaiah, and this is Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 7. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in its quiver. He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and to gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob, and to bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a lot for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, The Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of the rulers, kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see you and bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. 
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. God. May God add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this word that we share today. In our culture here in America, we believe in the ability of a human being to be upwardly mobile. We believe that with the right education, the right opportunities, the right family of origin, that we can become whoever we were meant to be. We can become someone important, someone great. We tell our children at our house that they can be anything that they want to be. That God has gifted them with with good minds, with opportunities, and they can grow up to be someone of importance. We all want to be important, right? We all want to be noticed and stand out from the crowd. That's part of the American dream. That's part of who we are. That's how we understand ourselves. It's it's a part of the very fiber of our beings. I can remember um, as a young child being taught the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer in the same first grade classroom by the same... um, thin, blonde-haired uh, teacher, Miss West, who once nearly shook my head off of my shoulders because I would not pay attention. <laughs> Those two things have been a part of my life, my entire life, the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. Sometimes, though, our self-understanding or our cultural understanding kind of bleeds over into our theology. And and that's okay because I believe that the Bible speaks to, to the day that it was um, written and it speaks to us today that it is alive and at work, that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, the apostle says, able to divide bone from marrow. Um, in this passage of scripture, the servant is described as having a mouth like a two-edged sword. So this person has been chosen from the time they were in their mother's womb. We see this as, this is another common thread in scripture. We see this in the Psalms where God has chosen this person to be king from the time that they were in their, in utero, they were chosen. Um, the prophet Jeremiah, God speaks to him in the very first part of his prophecy and said, while you were still in your mother's womb, I chose you. I chose you to stand up and speak for me. And, and we, if we're not careful, we, we can get off into a place where we think, um, maybe I'm not chosen. Maybe I'm not the chosen one because I can't seem to get things together. Or um, I constantly struggle with an addiction. Or I have this family of origin that didn't give me all of the advantages that a lot of people had. But that's not the case because... In Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, in Jesus Christ, it's all yes and amen. In Jesus Christ, we are children of the living God. We are, we are sons and daughters adopted as heirs of Christ. This, this whole idea of being chosen has created two completely divergent schools of thought in terms of, of what it means to be chosen. In Paul's words, predestined. If you are a Calvinist, so if you grew up in the Baptist or Presbyterian tradition, they believe um, in John Calvin, who was one of the founding fathers of their religious understanding. And he believes that there are certain people who were destined for salvation, and those people cannot escape the grasp of grace. And there are other people who were destined to be cord wood for the fires of hell. And I don't believe that's the case. And there is Arminius, who our United Methodist understanding is based on. And Arminius believed that God died for everyone, that Jesus gave himself for all of humanity, that we are all chosen, but that we have to make a volitional decision. We have to exercise our free will, not just to make a faith decision, not just to stand up and say and and make a confession of faith and join the church, but to live as faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Because Arminius believes that we can can wander away from grace, that we can, in fact, lose our salvation. 
So, so Calvin says, once saved, always saved. Arminius says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the Apostle Paul. I believe that Jesus is not only the God who chooses us, but that in Jesus we are all chosen. That, that nobody is excluded. That no matter how wide you draw the circle of grace, God always draws that circle wider. That no one is left out. And, and no one is excluded. No one is pushed to the margins. That with Jesus, with God Almighty, we are all chosen to be sons and daughters of God. Now, we can make a volitional choice and say in our hearts there is no God. Have, how many of you have seen that 2014 um, advertisement on TV lately by Ron Reagan? Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. Quite disturbing. Where Ron is, Ron is a self-avowed atheist and at the end of that commercial, he's trying to raise money for an atheist foundation, and he says that he's not afraid of the fires of hell. That's a pretty bold stroke. I, I mean, that's a bridge too far for me. I can't believe that our society has gotten to a point where, where people, to stand up on a, on, a, on a commercial to raise money for an atheist foundation and say that they're not afraid of the fires of hell. Listen, sure enough as there is a heaven, there is a hell. Jesus talks about it quite a bit. You don't believe me? Read Revelation for yourself. It talks about it a lot in there. I don't choose to use that to leverage an emotional response from people. Um, I don't believe that you ought to tell people they're going to hell in order that you can that you can scare the hell out of them. I don't think that's how Jesus worked. As I go back and look at the biblical text, Jesus met sinners where they are. Thanks be to God, he met me where I was. He'll meet you where you are, has met you where you are. Because he loves us. Because this God of grace is amazing. He offers us this opportunity to be in relationship with him. And that's what it's all about. It's all about a relationship. Now, when we read this prophecy, we read it on this side of the cross, in the shadow of the cross. And we, we look at that and we say, just like chapter 42 in Isaiah, chapter 49, it's about the suffering servant. It's about this servant that God has raised up who has this peaceful ministry. Um, in 42, it says that he won't crush a bruised reed or, or snuff out a barely burning wick. This God who defies all convention of his time, this Jesus who came in a time when there was all kind of radical teaching in Judaism. There were actually three distinct sects in Judaism. There were the Essenes who were very ascetic, very, um, very, Monastic, I guess you would say, set apart by themselves. They believed that the Sadducees had it all wrong and they had corrupted the um, sacrificial system because they were corrupt themselves. And that there was no atoning sacrifice because the, the priests themselves were so far out of line with God and God's will. And then there were the Pharisees who were the more, more liberal faction of Judaism in their day and they believed in a broader, um, a broader interpretation of Scripture and that, and that it was all about following the law. It was all about being obedient to those 623 commandments of, of the Torah and the Mishnah. And Paul says in his writing that he was an obedient member of the Pharisaic community, but that he was still lost and undone because he didn't believe, he didn't know Jesus Christ. We see this passage of Scripture, and we see Jesus. We immediately think of Jesus. Jesus is this suffering servant. Jesus is this one that is raised up and, and is, is the sharp two-edged sword, and is the sharp arrow in God's quiver, the one that was hid from the forces of darkness that would take his life back in Bethlehem. Y'all remember that a couple of weeks ago? We talked about that, and he has to flee to Egypt. And God is, in, God is directing the whole of Jesus' life. 
But how do we how do we make sense of that part where it says it says that the servant says that all that I've done is, is fruitless. It, I've not been a success. Um, I've wasted my labor and, and the labor's been in vain. But if you look at Jesus' ministry, in, especially in the immediate context, I'm not sure that you can call that a success. I mean, he set out to change the world from the inside of this, this oldest monotheistic religion in, the, in, in history, it, but he really didn't make a whole lot of change. He gathered a lot of disciples when he did miracles and when he fed the 5,000. When people brought their sick, he was, a, he was a, known as a healer. He healed people. He delivered people from demonic possession. We talk about that from time to time. He garnered a lot of attention and a big following. But then when things really began to get difficult, when he starts about talking talking about my body is true bread and my blood is the true, the true wine, I mean... People in the, in the Jewish understanding, they just can't get past that. It, and, it's, and it sends a lot of people away. So, so for a while, Jesus has a lot of buzz and a lot of following. But then slowly but surely, that kind of begins to fall away. And then soon enough, he's arrested and detained and beaten and killed by the people who, who hailed his triumphal entry. Those same people called for his crucifixion. The system into which he was born and, and, and he came to his own and they didn't know him. We talked about that last week. But this servant, especially in terms of what I just talked about, the, the laboring in vain and the lack of success, that servant, I think in a lot of ways, is probably you and I. Because sometimes we try really hard and, and what we work for doesn't yield results. And, and we stand up week after week and we teach a Sunday school class or we lead a youth group and we don't really see a lot of fruit coming from that. Or maybe we stand up week after week and preach the gospel and wonder if anybody's hearing what we have to say. But I want, I want you to know that a calling is not about success. A calling is about faithfulness. Can I get an amen? A calling is about knowing who you are and who God calls you to be. And when God speaks to this person, um, when he further refines this calling, and God says, yeah, I know, you know, everything didn't go the way you hoped. Um, you, there wasn't this huge success. You didn't stand out from the crowd. You didn't gain notoriety. You're not this evangelist on TV riding in million-dollar million jets back and forth doing revivals and and meetings. But God doesn't, God doesn't say that calling isn't who you are anymore. God says, no, you're still called. And God doesn't shrink what he's asking you to do. In fact, that passage of scripture tells us that, that the servant, not only is he called to restore Jacob, not only is he called to call back the, the lost of Israel, but he's called to be a light to the nations. So when we have those little dark nights of the soul, and, and men and women, boys and girls, we all have them, amen? We all have dark nights of the soul. When we feel like what we're doing is fruitless, like everything that we've worked for, everything that we believe, the culture is just throwing it out piecemeal. Like we've become, on some level, we've become irrelevant to the world around us. I want to tell you this one thing. If you're going to shine your light, you've got to know the world in which you're going to shine your light. You've got to be willing to go down to double quick and sit in a bench and eat a piece of fried chicken and listen to people swear and get ready to preach a sermon. You can't just live in your living room and open your Bible and not encounter the world. You have to encounter the world. And when you encounter the world... You see the darkness, but the darkness does not overcome the light. Even the greatest darkness can't snuff out a barely burning candle. Your call's not smaller, it's bigger. The God that you were called to serve, that call is still valid and at work. 
and the light that you have in your heart, and it may just be flickering, is still a light shining in the darkness. <clears throat> may it burn brightly in the name of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? Would you pray with me with your eyes wide open to see the faces of your brothers and sisters in Christ? Look to your right and your left and see those people. You're the light. You're the light, Nathan. You're the light, Mary. You're the light, Sam. You're the light, Lord, too. We are all the light of Christ. He's called us to be light in the darkness, and it is dark right now, very dark. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we quit. In fact, if if it means anything, it means that we work a little harder. And so may God bless us with the light of Christ. May He kindle that fire within us through the power of His Holy Spirit. May he continue to call and equip us for the work of God's kingdom, that it may come here on earth as in heaven. Amen. <coughs> the hymn of invitation is 419. I am thine, O Lord. Let us stand together and sing all four verses.